Well, there are many people who never want to talk about the bad things that have happened in their lives. There are others who find a way to process those experiences by writing and sharing it with the world. It requires an incredible amount of vulnerability, but it's often those songs, poems, and stories that have the greatest impact on other people. So today on Blue Sky, we'll talk to someone who wants to help people take their worst moments and turn them into material. We'll hear from guests about the art of burying your soul, and if this is something that you have experience with, we'd love it if you would join the conversation by calling 1-800-716-2221 or email bluesky at cbc.ca. CA. Patricia Dawn Robertson says nothing is off limits. She often draws inspiration for her own writing from her family and some of the challenging things she's experienced. She's turned those experiences into stories for popular publications such as Reader's Digest, The Walrus, Broadview, and Canadian Living. And now she's hoping to help others do the same thing. She's hosting a personal essay workshop entitled Taking Your Worst Moments and Turning Them Into Material. And she joins us on the line right now from her home in Waka. Patricia, hello. Hi, Alicia. Welcome to Blue Sky. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm very intrigued by this workshop. So tell us a little bit about it. What made you want to hold it? Well, to be perfectly honest, money. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. I get that. This is how, you, how you make your yeah. living. <laughs> I'm a freelance writer, and I started thinking, actually, to back up a little bit, I was doing some contributions to the Winnipeg Free Press, and I decided in my wisdom to wade into the vaccine debate, Ooh. which resulted in some violent threats to my editor, Russell Wangerski, who used to edit the papers here. So Russell said, Patricia, I think we should take a pause, which prompted me to think, oh, my God. A steady stream of income has now dried up. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to take my worst moments <laughs> and I'm going to turn it into a workshop. So that's sort of what originated that situation. Because I do, I've been entirely freelance since 1997 with one brief break working at the Calgary Strait as the editor. So a lot of it really stems from uh, just the current situation for writers, uh, the shifting uh kind of scenario that I find myself in. So that's the honest answer. And also the desire at 61 to mentor people, to help them, and to share some of this information. Like I've spent all of these years developing these skills. Now they're just going to just die with me if I if I go. So I sort of started thinking about legacy. And I've taught a few workshops in the past, and I've got quite a bit of teaching experience. And I thought it's time to turn away from doing um, controversial commentaries. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe turn my hand to something constructive, as my mother would suggest, right? Why don't you do something constructive, Patricia? So that's sort of where I came from. Well, I really appreciate that honesty because I think that's really what's at the heart of the workshop that you'll lead because mm -hmm. you have titled it Taking Your Worst Moments and Turning Them Into Material. So what is it ab about that that you think would resonate with others? Well, I think there's a redemptive element to it. So what I found is if I can't find the funny in a, in a worst moment situation, I look for the meaning or the lesson, and that gives me some redemption from that lesson or relief from seeing the absurdity of my situation, which is I've been writing commentaries for decades, and here I am tripping on the most significant and, you know, sort of red herring issue that we're dealing with right now. So in a way, what kind of journalist am I? <laughs> so it, it puts me into reflective mode and dealing with my aging parents, as I've written about quite a bit, much to my mother's displeasure. Um, that also helped me cope with dealing with all of the issues that come with an aging parent. And because a lot of people are dealing with that in my age group and it, start, it starts to weigh on you and become a burden. And so I didn't want it to become a burden. I wanted to sort of learn the lesson from it, but also maybe find some of the absurdity in it as well. Because I will be also aging, as my mother constantly reminded me. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> yeah, and anytime we had a conflict, she would say to me, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> and just, you know, and I'd be like, true. true. Yeah. Just yeah. not right now. Not this minute. I, I'm <laughs> feeling it. You said something so. interesting, though, that I want to ask you more about, much to your mother's displeasure. So often when we're mm -hmm. writing about ourselves, we, we are connected to other people. So how how do you navigate that? Your story isn't just, our stories aren't just about ourselves. They involve so many other people. Exactly, which is really the pitfall of memoir for everybody. And so um, I'm going to quote another writer, um, Sheshlav Malosh, who said, when a writer is born into a family, that family is finished. 
So where my mother was concerned, she wanted me to go into law because I was argumentative. My father was a late sports writer, John Robertson, quite a larger than life character. And she didn't want another one in our family. Like one John was enough. And so I went into this. And then I started writing about my mom. I did a piece for the Winnipeg Free Press called The Velvet Hammer for her for Mother's Day. And she was had, ambivalent about it when I phoned after it had run because I didn't tell her I was doing it. So I kind of did a bit of an ambush. And then she went to mass the next week to their little, you know, rural church in Winnipeg Beach. And everybody just extolled the virtues of my piece. Oh, she's captured you perfectly. It's a wonderful portrayal. So my mom picked up the phone after church the next week and said, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is which is nice, but the thing is, not everyone's going to like to like what we do. And I and I've been thinking a lot about. I mean, there's so many different ways that we tell stories. You know, I, I mean, I, I talk on the radio. We have social media accounts. Some people might dabble in in mm-hmm. writing. And so, do you do you ever ask for permission? Is there consent that needs to be received? I'm just wondering. You know, just some of those logistical things. Like you may someone may be mm-hmm. driven to write. But can you know? Is there a conversation that needs to be that needs to be had beforehand? The problem with the conversation that happens beforehand is it tends to flatten out the prose. So a good example: my father was diagnosed with dementia in two thousand and nine. He's a public figure. My mother didn't really want that going public because she saw it as potentially embarrassing or shameful, which is not the way to view dementia. But there you have it. So I started writing about it. Um, I started a book called Me- Media Brat, a memoir that's forthcoming in May. And I started writing down the stories. And I applied to the Arts Board for a grant. And they gave me some money. So I spent the next few years writing about my father. Because I knew all the stories were disappearing with him. So if I'd asked their permission, my dad would have said, because he always did, write whatever you want. Because he did that to me as mm-hmm. a child. And my mom would have been, what will people think? So if I had my mom on my shoulder when I was working on that memoir, what will people think would have been in the, for, in the, in the, you know, in the foreground all the time, and I would have censored myself. And so all of the good stories, the stories that people want to hear, would have been turned into a PR exercise, talking about all the good things that dad did and what a wonderful father he was. And then it sort of just turns into a brochure. And so I knew I could, and of course, they're both dead now. So that takes a lot of the pressure off me because you can't libel the dead. But you are right, Leisha. You have to be concerned about which territory you go into with people, especially if you're going into delicate material that could potentially really damage somebody's reputation. Like a lot of trauma memoir goes into those categories. And you need to have a publisher to work with and an editor to work with. You are going to take you out of the gutter if you jump into that. And you're also going to need to maybe have a lawyer look at it too, just to say, yeah. have I gone too far? Yeah. Does this disparage this person? Does it humiliate them? Will it uh, hurt their opportunity to get future work? You know, because you're right. You are wielding a fairly, you're wielding a fairly big hammer when you do memoir. So because I've been a writer for so many years, I innately kind of understand from doing all the commentaries I've done when I'm, um, reaching the point that I've gone too far. and uh, But usually there's a good editor at the other end. Like there's certainly, the, I work with Jerry Johnson at the Globe and Mail. He's retired now, but he always kept me in line if he felt that I was uh, going too far. So you do need to have feedback from other people, but you also have to sort of use your own judgment. Like, how would you feel if someone wrote that about you? Yeah. Right. What would that what would your response be? And that isn't to say, I mean, I have a brother who lives in Texas and he hasn't seen this book yet. And so my next task now, you know, at the end of the week will be to text him. Hey, Tim, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> and, but I will have him read it before I, before it goes to press. Lisa, because the prospect of alienating my only sibling um, would not uh, sit well with me. So yeah. I think there's that aspect of it. So, but I will also probably preface it with, I'm really not prepared to change too much of this. There's, he comes off very well in the book, as do my parents, but there are, it's warts and all, I think I end up looking more like the fool <laughs> throughout the book. I mean, that's certainly how I've positioned it. And my mom figures a lot more prominently in it than my dad does, which I was surprised by. So I think, yeah, so now I have to face down my brother. But I wouldn't publish it without consulting him because um, he he he's a businessman and he's a bit litigious. <laughs> so yeah, there's he- another layer to our family. He's an alpha like I am. So I think it's respecting the boundaries, but also knowing... It's your story to tell, and he has his his stories to tell, right? So I think that's where we land with this is 
make sure that you're not doing anything that's going to cause irreparable harm to your relationships, but don't hold back so much that you don't say anything at all. And then it just becomes the bland problem, right, that no one wants to read. So it's it's striking that balance. It's a bit of a tightrope. So when it's you not easy. it's not Sorry. definitely not easy when you do yeah. bring people together and you and you are working with folks who hope to write shorter pieces maybe they'll turn into books but it's an essay workshop that you're holding yeah what yeah. are the, what are the stories that people want to read how could we be mining our own lives for potential material well look for the stories that you don't want to tell <laughs> right <laughs> also look for things that circle around in your head like, I get upset about certain issues. Like, something will just sit in my head and sit in my head and sit in my head. And then finally, I'll wake up one day and go, oh, I have to write about that. So anything that's catching you obsessively, anything that you feel, oh, my God, I couldn't write that. I can't write about that. That's horrible. You know, try it and see where it takes you. But also decide if you're going to go for serious or if you're going to go for funny. Because if you go for funny, that will drain some of the tension out of it. And it will turn it into a little bit of a lighter subject matter, which I tend to go funny only because that's my defense mechanism. I don't want to go too serious. I've had like people in workshops tell me, what are you hiding? You know, (laughs) and I think it's important to know, like, you might have something in there that you don't think is interesting. Like certainly living in rural Saskatchewan, I hear stories about the farm and about the history and homesteading here from people and all the time. And they just think that's just normal. Whereas for me, it's like, well, tell me more. You mean your dad built his own cabin? <laughs> he yeah. cleared the land and then built the cabin? Like for someone like me who's from the city, that's a remarkable feat. So I think it's just a matter of recognizing what is the story that you're, that kernel that you're carrying around that you maybe don't think about. And also what subject matter obsesses you. Like if you're obsessed with climate change, then write about it, right? Write, a, write an essay about why the earth matters to you so much and why you're so concerned. I find that that helps. I mean, just even watching the news cycle for me will trigger something usually. Right now, it's homelessness. That seems to be my current thing. And I I said to my partner, Grant, last night, who edits all my work, by the way, and and makes me sound smart. I said to him, I want to do a book on homelessness. And he just kind of looks at me like, okay. (laughs) That sounds like, you know, that's a big project. Maybe finish the other stuff you're working on right now. But that will trigger me. I'll watch something and I'll see the Houston model where they're, they're, housing people now they've had like they had the worst homelessness rate in the united states and now they've started housing people because they put housing first and so i winnipeg's now going to be looking at that too so i look at those kind of things and i think oh, that's going in the drawer then that's a big idea and that goes in the drawer but a smaller idea might be writing about my siberian forest cats and and their sibling rivalry right that might make a better thing for christian science monitor than taking on a whole major topic so i think i just tell people like do something you can manage something that's manageable and something that you're going to enjoy doing because writing is work. And so if you don't like the subject matter, it's going to seem like a homework assignment that never ends. So I also say go with your passion, right? Follow the grain in your own wood. What are you excited about? I want to ask you one last question before we let you go, because mm. what's in it for the reader? Like, I, I know what I'm drawn to, and I think the more personal stuff is what really gets me, what, what resonates with me. But what do you think is in it for the reader when we do allow ourselves to open up and share a messy part of our lives? Well, they're coming along with you for a bit of a journey. It's almost like going to a dinner party, right? And you become the raconteur. And so what is in it for them is hopefully some identification with some of the challenges that you're confronting, or maybe looking at something from a different angle, seeing something from a funny angle that they didn't once see. For example, my parents uh, taking my brother and I out to dinner before they were headed to Arizona, to their house in Arizona, and telling my brother and I that they'd taken out beheading insurance. And as such, if they were beheaded en route to the United States, we would each, we would share a million dollars. Oh my goodness. At this point. That is material. That's, that's material. That's material, right? (laughs) So those are the kind of things that I use because I know someone on the other side is going to go, where did they get that idea? Oh, it was a CAA blow-in. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think you're going to have some fun with this, Patricia. Thanks so much for setting it up for us. And you've really created the space for us to keep talking about this on, on the show. So thank you. And I'm just going to remind uh, people that they can reach me at robertsonblackcreative.com if they want to register for the workshop and that it's being held in at Midtown Plaza at the studio. Awesome. Th- thanks so much, yeah. Patricia. Thanks, Alicia. Take care.
That is Patricia Don Robertson holding a workshop on Saturday, April 30th, as you heard, here in Saskatoon at Midtown. Now, there are a lot of people who are looking to their own lives for inspiration, for art. Singer-songwriter uh, Megan Nash has taken some tough moments and turned it into music. In 2021, she released Soft Focus, and that is when she told CBC about the story behind her song, Artifact. I wrote that song shortly after returning from a six-week tour in Europe. And during that six-week tour, um, I was on one side of the world and my my ex was moving out of the house that we had lived in together. So when I got back from the tour, I was, you know, continuing the, the, the cleanup, getting settled back in and just coming across, you know, different photographs and notes and things. And... Uh, Kind of, it was just a strange, heartbreaking experience. <laughs> I have talked to him about uh, some of the songs off the latest album. Like my latest album, Soft Focus Futures, definitely ended up being a divorce album. And um, yeah, we're on we're on good terms and everything. But um, he knows that's how I, I process. I use songwriting as a way to try to make sense and understand uh situations and mainly how i feel <laughs> about situations um it's 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 so important for me to process events and to really feel my feelings and that's what i do with my songwriting process learning trying trying my best to learn more about myself and more about others around me and so i can be more honest with myself and with the people i love and ultimately because i do turn this into you know songs my audience I stumbled upon an old photograph Remember the words that made you laugh And it floored me You adored me
Nash with Artifact off her album Soft Focus. Megan will be playing on the same bill as Shred Kelly at the Capitol Music Club in Saskatoon on April 25th. I'm Alicia Grabinski. This is Blue Sky. And today we're talking about using material from your life, for your writing, for poetry, for songs, for your art. It does require an incredible amount of vulnerability. And there are those who find a way to process those experiences by writing and sharing it with the world. And so if you have some experience with this, we'd love it if you would join the conversation by calling 1-800-716-2221. You can also email bluesky at cbc.ca. Our next guest has poured eight years of grief, trauma, self-discovery, and healing into her latest project. Courtney Bates-Hardy has an upcoming book launch both in Regina and Saskatoon for her new poetry book, Anatomical Venus. She's in our Regina studio. Courtney, welcome to Blue Sky. Thank you. And congratulations on your new book. Thank you. It's exciting. Yeah, and it, and it fits so well with our theme today. We're talking about turning your worst moments into material. And so I am wondering what life experiences have you drawn in for this book? Uh, so there was a lot that I drew into this, but um, the, bar- the book really starts with um, a, a piece that I wrote right after I was in my second rollover car accident. Um, in my second year of university. And that piece really kind of opens up the whole book and um, the sort of journey that I've been on since those accidents um, caused uh, nerve pain to my, or nerve damage to my neck. So I experienced chronic nerve pain um, as a result of those accidents. When did you decide that this was something you wanted to write about? Um, It actually took me a long time to even realize that that's what I was writing about. I initially started writing about monsters and wax anatomical models. And it wasn't until I had written some poems and done some research on those things that I realized that what was actually coming through was a more personal experience um, and that um, what I was writing about was related to what I was experiencing as far as chronic pain and disability. How do you think writing about it changed the way you you viewed the experience? It gave me a way to process it. Um, it was um, a very long process of even accepting that I experienced chronic pain and disability. Um, for a long time, I really hoped that I would be able to heal from it, that, you know, the physio and the medications and the, the exercises I was doing would eventually just heal it and that it would go away. And that was not the case. And so in writing about it, that was my process of accepting it and grieving um, who I thought I was going to be or um, that I would not experience this pain anymore. Yeah. Can you tell me if you're comfortable just a little bit more about what it is like to live live with chronic pain and just how how much this accident changed your life? Are you able to give us a sense of what it is you you deal with? I think a lot of people wouldn't realize that um, I experience chronic pain because I do hide it. Um, and most of the time, um, I am you know, fully functional. I work a full-time job. I um, have my writing that I do as well. I exercise. I do a lot of the same things that anyone else would do, but um, I have to be much more careful than most people. Um, There are a lot more things that will cause more pain or will mean that I will need to take more of a rest um, or that Simply, it's just harder to pay attention when you're in pain and um, need to be in a certain situation, like at work or at an event, um, and you can't change that. So writing about it makes it more visible. It definitely does, um, because it's it's not something that I talk a lot about in my day-to-day life. So this book is really kind of taking that out to the public and going, yeah, this is this is what I experience. And you 
might not know this about me. Does that make you feel pretty vulnerable? Absolutely. It's a very vulnerable experience um, because I spend a lot of time trying to just do what um, everyone else does. Does it also give you a bit more agency over your own story, the act of writing about it? Yeah, it was an opportunity to tell my story from my own perspective um, and not how other people see me. Um, so that was also part of writing the book was just being able to to share um, what it's like to be me. And do you hope that some people who read it might have a point of connection? You know, I think a lot of um, readers are often looking for stories that they connect with. Maybe it's an experience completely different than one's own, but also uh, sometimes people gravitate to stories that are similar to yours. And so you're hoping some of that happens. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people out there um, who, you know, by looking at someone, you can't know what they're going through or what their struggles are. And so I hope that the people who need to read Anatomical Venus um, find it and that they find it helpful and um, that they see themselves in it. I think I've, I've tried to write it in such a way that it is applicable to more experiences um, because disability is such a spectrum and um, I can't speak for everyone who experiences disability, but I know, um, I know what it's like uh, for myself. And so I think there will be things that other people can find uh, in that experience that will resonate with them. How much do you think you changed through the whole writing process and all the reflection and processing that you've been able to do through this work? Do you feel different today than when you first started the project? Yeah, I mean, it took eight years. So I am a very different person now than I was eight years ago. And that's just the nature of um, life that uh, over time we we change and we have to adjust to that. I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about some of your other writing because you I understand that you write about family members. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and how you weave in stories of others into the into the writing that you're doing. Yeah, so mainly with this book, I wrote about my mom and my nana because they um, both experience chronic pain and have had struggles with different illnesses and chronic pain as well. And so it was important for me to write about them and to kind of honor their struggles that came before mine and um, what I saw them go through. Is the experience different writing about yourself versus writing about the moments that involve others? I'm just curious about that. If one is harder than the other or if there's any kind of different thinking that goes into the different types of stories that you're telling? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that it's different so much because often I'm still writing from my own perspective. I can't know what it's like uh, for them. And so I'm only writing about what I saw um, and from my own perspective of, of what, um, what they were going through mm -hmm. at the time. Why was it important for you to share those snapshots from your perspective into moments uh, of your life with, with your mom and, and with your grandmother? I think it was important for me to be able to process that um, because it is very difficult to watch someone you love go through so much pain and um, especially when a lot of those instances kind of happened when I was still fairly young. Um, so it was a way for me to process that myself and um, kind of come to terms with it. So you have two book launches coming up. Do you want to tell people a bit more about where and, and when people can buy your book? Sure. So uh, there's a launch coming up in Saskatoon next week, April 24th 
um, at the McNally Robinson Booksellers. And then uh, in Regina, it'll be April 30th at the Artesian um, at 7 p.m. And my book is available now in um, any bookstore. Uh, You can also request it from your local library. From the local library. Love that. And how are you feeling ahead of it all, Courtney? It must be a whole ton of emotions. That's a lot of emotions. (laughs) Excited, anxious, all of the things. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That is Courtney Bates-Hardy, the author of Anatomical Venus. And as you just heard, she does have two book launches coming up, both uh, one in Regina and one in Saskatoon. I'm Leisha Gravinsky. You are listening to Blue Sky here on CBC Radio 1, 540 a.m. across Saskatchewan, 94.1 FM in Saskatoon, 102.5 FM in Regina, and streaming live on CBC Listen. Today we're we're talking about how to take moments from your life, the the difficult stuff, and, and turning it into material. And so we've heard from a couple of writers today. If this resonates with you and if if you've taken moments from your own life and turned it into something, an art project, uh, music, perhaps you're a writer, we'd love to hear about your experience. So you can call us 1-800-716-2221. You can also email bluesky at cbc.ca. Well, our next guest says songwriting helps him process difficult experiences and emotions. Marvin Chan is the founder and artistic director of Trifecta Sound Co., which won two Sask Music Industry Awards in December. He's played in a variety of bands, including Samurai Champs and Ghost Form, but his solo singer-songwriter project is Merv XX Gaudi, and he is in our Regina studio. Marvin, hello. Hey, what's up? Hey, so you've been listening along to the show. We've heard from a couple of other writers, people who write novels, essays, poetry. We heard from a songwriter earlier on the show, too. And I'm wondering, from those conversations, you know, has anything you've heard resonated with your own experience? Yeah, I love that writing can be a way to process, but also for me, it feels more like a way of integrating, I guess, because... One thing I never really seem to resonate with other writers, I think, is I don't identify as a writer. I've always been a math person growing up. And even when I have friends in publishing or songwriting and they say, like, oh, I hope you write a book with your ideas and your adventures one day, I immediately say, I'm never going to do that. Because <laughs> it writing ne- has never, ever made sense to me, except in the context of songwriting. And even then, it still doesn't really, I feel like, The words aren't really words. They're just sounds that come out of me. Oh, my gosh. Tell me more about that. And I'm fascinated by the fact that you would identify as a math person, and yet you are writing music. So tell me a bit more about your process. Oh, yeah. My my first degree is in software engineering. And I originally went to engineering because I thought it was a way I could avoid writing for the rest of my life. And then when I realized lab reports were a thing, I decided against that, too. But I think... A lot of it was ever since I was young, I could only really remember thinking in patterns and numbers. And then the most painful part of school, I remember, would always be writing in a journal. I was like, why is someone making me do this? And then for a long time, I was um, working at a yoga studio here in Regina, the Bodhi Tree. And there's a lot of yoga books there. And then I remember reading a lot about Sanskrit and how a lot of the the way words are formed, it's actually quite closer to Cantonese, which is um, my my mom's mother tongue, mm-hmm. and how the syllables, how everything's pronounced, is supposed to make you feel the way it's intended for you to feel, as opposed to in English, you can say the same word very differently, and then it elicits a different feeling for someone. Right? You can say the same word and make someone feel antagonized, but also feel loved, and then so I kind of took that idea from Sanskrit, I think, and then um, kind of also combined it because my other band, Samurai Champs, is with my best friend, Savan. That's a a hip-hop and R&B project, which is very different than this. And Savan would always tell me, you know, we can't use what you can use. You can sing, but rappers can't do that. We don't have melody. All we can do is really pay attention to the way we say the word, and hopefully that conveys the emotion in a way that you convey emotion through melody. So taking those two ideas from hip-hop and Sanskrit, I thought, okay, maybe this is a way I can write songs. So to me, all the words I write are just like texts. (laughs) 
<laughs> They're kind of just text or note app diary type things. I don't really think that much about like the literary, I guess, <laughs> the, the literary aspects of it. I just try to hope the syllables feel and sound right. And then when I sing it, I see how that makes me feel. But then when I sing it, I also see how my engineer feels or how the audience seems to feel. And then when I see a certain reaction, like people see, seem comfortable or maybe they're about to fall asleep, which probably means they're relaxed, I'm like, okay, I think that's the word. That's very powerful stuff. So we have been talking about people taking their worst moments and, and turning it into material. You have a totally different process, which I love. But I'm wondering, ha- have you done that? Have you taken some of your, your worst moments and, and turned it into material? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. But I think in the way maybe people can process how they're feeling through words, it's strange because it doesn't seem like a a straightforward bridge like that to me. I guess a lot of the time I feel like the way I'm feeling is not actually feeling. It's stopped, almost like a mechanical system or something. And then the way other people describe it, you have to feel through it. That actually feels a lot more like a multi-stage system to me. And so I think this might be from, I know this is really different now, but I grew up in a Cantonese household where conversations about mental health and mental illness weren't really a thing at all. Um, They just weren't really ideas that existed at the time. And again, it's super different now with, you know, everything being on Netflix now. But I don't think I had the internal vocabulary, emotional vocabulary, really, to be able to feel how I was feeling. And then the only way I could feel things, I think, even growing up afterwards, after I learned how to play the guitar and actually write songs, was through writing the songs. But even then, when I was writing the songs, it never felt like writing. It always felt like this is the only way I'm actually able to feel something that's happening to me. And usually that stuff was heartbreak or despair or sometimes being happy, but it was the only way that really facilitated feeling, I think. Things that are hard to talk about. So do you, do you ever worry about what your family will think when, when you write about that tough stuff and, 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 um, and about mental health challenges? Um, I think I used to, and I don't really anymore. I've kind of just accepted it as that's just the way my mind and body seems to function. And I think they've learned to accept it also because they've they've seen the effects of it also. Like you can't you can't ignore like the visceral effects things are having. When I I remember Samurai Champs got home from we've been basically touring straight for two years, and my parents always knew like I I love to work. Like I always loved working on my stuff. Even while I was in school, I loved working at my friend's Korean sushi restaurant. And for the first time in my life, I couldn't work. And they thought that was so strange. I just lied in bed. I couldn't even open my MacBook. The blue light from the MacBook screen would, like, make me panic. Mm -hmm. And again, there was no conversation about this kind of stuff, so I had no idea what was going on. And they they were, like, pretty freaked out, too. And then with time, once they saw, oh, the only things that really made me feel, not even feel better, but start to function again, like be able to open up a MacBook or look at my phone, was writing songs, and doing jiu-jitsu, and that was about it. Okay, you have a song about jiu-jitsu. Do you want to set it up for us? We're going to play it. What, what's it about? Um, <laughs> again, I'm not really a language person. Like, even on stage, I'll straight up say, I'm a very literal person. The I don't know, Marvin. Called jiu-jitsu. <laughs> you, you've kind of blown me away with your words right now, but I, 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 I get it, but maybe... <laughs> You do have skills, let me tell you. Um, but is it as simple as that? It's about a, a sport and and working through something quite viscerally? Um, well, around that time in 2018, I guess that would be like classified as like my first breakdown. The only thing I really could do was go to jiu-jitsu. And I think a reason for that now is so much of what I do may be so cognitive, I guess. And jiu-jitsu is almost the inverse of cognitive, like it's so primal. You can't really think about the future or past or ruminate about anything when you're getting your head ripped off. And then the feeling that came from jujitsu made me think of every other time that I've had to use songwriting to process 
or integrate something just because it's not really like a pleasurable activity like you have some guy's large intestine on your face and people are sweating on you and you don't really know why you're there but then at the same time you're like wait this is horrible I hate this but maybe I have to be here okay maybe I have to learn to love this and then I love this and then every line in jujitsu the song is basically a reference to every moment that that feeling has occurred in my life I think okay well let's listen to it now Here's jiu-jitsu. quite moved by that. Wow. <laughs> Especially with your setup and knowing what went into that. That's quite something. You you had a teacher at Jiu-Jitsu and, and there was a conversation that happened, right? That kind of sparked yeah. part, part of the song. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, this was well after the song was made, but it's still kind of always like an ongoing thing. Like I think we're always changing and learning about ourselves and same thing our Art's always changing, whether it's songwriting, songwriting or jujitsu. And I think I just had like just a bad day at work or something. I must have been frustrated and I don't really get to move. Like I, I pretty much work online all the time. And I think this kind of came out at the gym. I go to this gym here in Regina called um, Sweep Science. I guess it's called Regina Jiu-Jitsu now. But my coach, John, I think he noticed and he was like, you know, we have to find our own reason for being here. And it's really ridiculous. Like we're taking time away from our girlfriends and our families and our friends and we're going to be sore the next day. There's like no reason to really be here. But you keep coming back. So there's got to be a reason that you got to find. And I think that was actually really apt for a lot of us. It actually may be better to think about why we keep doing things or why we keep showing up to things, especially art. You know, we, we all know AI may take every art job ever. So, <laughs> but ultimately, I think we all know that we do it for ourselves. And I think that's kind of why I kept going to jujitsu too, because if I'm not songwriting, it is like kind of the only thing that makes me kind of figure out why I'm feeling the way I am. Yeah. What, what do you see as the benefit of making yourself, putting yourself out there like this? Like, I think everybody we've talked to definitely put yourself in a bit of a vulnerable position by um, by sharing stuff in this way. What's what's the benefit of that, do you think? Um, I mean, this may not be, like, 
a really entertaining answer, but again, I'm kind of like more of a numbers guy and I just count the amount of times I've been vulnerable or just lead, leaned into the thing that felt bad. And I don't know, it's like more than 95% of the time, it's always ended up better after that, you know, in terms of growth or discovery, discovering something, learning something. And anytime it's kind of leaned away from, I feel like, yeah, I mean, if it, if it doesn't make it worse, it kind of just delays something that's going to blow up in your face anyway. <laughs> Marvin, AI is not taking away any of our art or creators because of people like you. <laughs> we don't need to worry if you're the one creating stuff. AI is not going to be able to replace what you've just brought us today. It's been so wonderful having you as a guest. Thank you for sharing. It's been a real pleasure. So thank you. Thank you. It's Marvin Chan who's the founder and artistic director of Trifecta Sound Co., which won two Sask Music Industry Awards in December. He's played in a variety of bands, including Samurai Champs and Ghost Form, but his solo singer-songwriter project is Merv XX Gaudi. At the start of the show, we heard from Patricia Dawn Robertson, and she's got this workshop happening in Saskatoon. And so if people want information about that workshop, turning your worst moments into material, you can email us and then we can share the link with you. So email us at bluesky at cbc.ca. I'm Leisha Gravinsky. You've been listening to us on CBC Radio 1, 540 AM across Saskatchewan, 94.1 FM in Saskatoon and 102.5 FM in Regina. Of course, streaming live too on CBC Listen.